Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting for October 22nd, 2019. Uh, it's super busy in the Austin office today, so we're running this meeting in fully distributed mode. Fingers crossed that the technology involved holds up to its end of the deal. We'll find out. Let's hop in. We've got some new modules this week. Our own Dean Welch added a new module targeting a buffer overflow in the uh, invulnerable version 1.5.0 of the file sharing wizard software. This module allows a remote attacker to obtain arbitrary code execution by exploiting a structured exception handler based buffer overflow in an HTTP post parameter, which is pretty cool. Uh, we'll have a demo of that. Contributor Kalebot added a new post module targeting Nagios XI, allowing a user to gather available creds via an existing session and save them into the framework database. Super cool. And our own Brendan Waters added a new Windows module for establishing payload persistence on a target. Using a Windows feature that allows for debugging a specified process by name, this module sets the target up to run an attacker's payload whenever the specified process exits, both normal exit and abnormal exit. And we'll have a demo of this. And some other interesting work going on. Uh, our own Emmett Kelly added new support for authenticating with the Metasploit RPC web service in the absence of an attached database. It's great for when you need the Metasploit RPC web service, but not the database. Contributor Zero Steiner updated the SMB client library to understand if a target requires messages be signed and also added the ability for our SMB version scanner to discover when that is the case for a target. Super cool. Contributor Tim Wright added support for mouse and key events to the Java interpreter, which is awesome. Our own Adam Kamek updated Frameworks check code logic to support custom messages for each of the possible outcomes, allowing modules to provide the user with specific details around the check result being returned. And related to module documentation, a great team effort by WEH, NSA, and Hoodie in adding documentation for a number of modules. We certainly appreciate that. And we also have a new tool courtesy of contributor H. Kerma for identifying modules which are missing documentation and also documentation which has become orphaned due to module renaming. Uh, this tool even goes the extra mile of outputting human friendly markdown, which is super cool. And as a bonus, we also received a snazzy new banner from contributor OX Gilda paying homage to a certain untitled waterfowl. Keep an eye out for it on your next MSF console run. And some bug fixes. Yay, bug fixes. Contributor B. Coles added a few fixes to the shell session handler, including not calling strip on a nil object when searching for a binary executable, and also ensuring that cleanup operations do work as expected when the path contains space characters. Prior to this, paths with a space would be seen as multiple arguments, which could lead to unexpected files and directories being deleted on cleanup, as well as not cleaning up the intended files. So these are good fixes to have. Contributor Zero Steiner fixed an issue with Python uh, reverse HTTP and reverse HTTPS payload stagers, ensuring the first stage is now correctly generating so that payload execution happens as expected. Great fixes there. Contributor Hoodie fixed a no method error exception in the ATutor SQL injection exploit module, which is awesome. And our own Brent Cook added a fix to the RDP library method, which does response license parsing removing a potential false negative condition for modules like the BlueKeep scanner. Uh, for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts at blog.rapid7.com. There it is. And as always, a huge thanks to all who helped make Metasploit better through their contributions. Thank you. Those are some awesome animations, I got to say. Good work. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right, now here's where it all falls apart. Demos, and I'm first. All right. Um, I'm going to show off the file sharing wizard uh, remote code execution demo. Uh, let's see here. Let me change my share. Can folks see my desktop okay? Maybe like a Windows VM? Yep. And like a console? Awesome. So I'm starting at MSF console over here on the left side. On the right side, I've got Windows 7 Ultimate, x86, Service Pack 1. Uh, I'll go ahead and start up while the console is starting up here. I'll start up the file sharing wizard. And this is a demo version. So it basically tells you, oh, you can only share one folder at a time. I go, OK, fine. And that's it there. Uh, we'll go ahead and tell it to go ahead and start sharing. Uh, so this is a tool that's you know very handy for people on Windows systems that just want to you know uh, share uh, 
files with other people, but don't want to go to the trouble of, you know, running an FTP server or a full up web server. Uh, so we go back over to console. Hey, look, it's that new goose banner. That's awesome. All right. So in this case, this is the new module, uh, exploit windows, HTTP file sharing wizard, structured exception handler or SEH for short. So we will use this module. Um, it's going to exploit a, let me see here, the, the make sure I get this right, structured exception handler based buffer overflow via an HTTP post parameter. First, we need to do is we need to set our R hosts to the vulnerable target, which is, if I recall correctly, 128.25. Once we've done that, we can set our payload, what we want to run. How about Windows? Oh, hit tab, hold on, um, interpreter. And then find TCP, for example. If I could spell TCP. And then we'll run that. Oh, sorry. Actually, we'll do a check first, see if it's vulnerable. So that says the service is random, it could not be validated. So hey, maybe it's vulnerable. Let's give it a shot. Give it a run. Buffer overflow happens. Structured exception handler goodness. And bam, we've got a session. We'll see. Make sure I who I am, get UID. Uh, it's my Windows user, and let's see, sysinfo, just for grins, and there it is, Windows 7, blah, 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 all called out there. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Uh, any questions? Um, Mr. Chen, you you good to go, sir? Uh, yeah, whenever you're ready. All right, can you guys see? Yeah, it looks good. Cool. All right. Uh, so I, today I'm going to demo uh, a, a content management system from TotalJS. So TotalJS is basically a platform for a uh, framework for Node.js, and then uh, the the CM, and then there's like a CMS component to it. Um, I kind of looked around on a on a on the web. It kind of looks like uh, the, the, there is def definitely some popularity with TotalJS and TotalJS servers running. So somewhat valuable. So basically what the problem is, in when you install TotalJS, uh, and, and you can download the, the CMS module, and then you can start it as a web server. And then uh, here you can see this is my TotalJS version, uh, TotalJS version, and this is my Node.js version. Uh, and then when you start it, you get a CMS. And then in the CMS, when you log in, so basically when you, when you start, it looks like that. And then you know you have all you have all these to to start with, but then there's like a path, an admin path. Uh, I'm already logged in, uh, but uh, so one little problem with uh, the the CMS is that it, it uses a default uh, username and password. So uh, and that's admin admin. So the, you might as well not have a password because you have a default one. Uh, and then after you log in, you can create. There, you know, all these things you can do, and one of those things that's really interesting is is widget. Uh, basically, they're like plugins to to the to CMS, and then you see this button right here called create, and then basically you can uh, you know name up the widget and then type up the widget and then source code. So immediately that's bad. Uh, if you look around the, the source, I mean Node Node.js is pretty easy to pretty easy to read and. It, you know, it, it doesn't take long to for you to find that there's a there's a function called compile. So basically, it's doing like custom thing, like something, something, and then code. Like it'll do that. So, so so what what's wrong with that? Basically, uh, you can inject JavaScript, and then you can uh, use JavaScript to execute code. Uh, so here, it has, there's some like custom like parsing going on so like for it's looking for the script and then for this uh, for this thing right here it's looking for either a total uh, total JS editor etc so you can do like you know something like that so basically that's, that's what the problem and then I created module just for that and then here uh, so there's like a check method the check method basically looks for the path and looking for making sure that it's it's a total JS setup. It does not actually trigger the vulnerability because uh, like if you trigger, you basically you're doing something dirty on the server. And I, I think I think I'll be too aggressive on, for a check, so I didn't do that. So basically, it supports Linux and Mac. So after a check, you just fire. Uh, 
There you go. And you get a shout. And sometimes you get two, like Will, what Will was seeing yesterday. Two is always better than one, I, I guess. And here you go. Yep, there you go. That's it. Super cool. Uh, any questions for Wei? Going is it is this a feature or is this a bug? This uh, this is a feature, uh, also a bug, I guess. I don't know. Well, it's not a, it's not a bug. It's a feature that you can abuse. Why not? Oh, right. Those are my favorite kind of features. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Way. All right. Uh, Brent, how are you looking, man? Looking good, man. All right. Let's, well, let's do this. Let me stop my share. share. I'll stop mine. All right, since today is Untitled Goose um, Framework Day, I'm going to go ahead and use that banner as well. Um, the vulnerability I'm going to show you guys today is something called Urgent 11. It came out a few months ago. It's uh, kind of a named vulnerability, or really a set of vulnerabilities in a particular IP stack that is embedded into a lot of different real-time operating systems. Um, the reason why this was called Urgent 11 is because there are 11 different vulnerabilities that the that the um, researchers found. Um, six of them were possibly exploitable for remote code execution. The others were more like just denial of service. Um, but basically, they all come down to the TCP IP stack not validating malformed packets. Um, a lot of these vulnerabilities were found in, I guess, semi-recent versions of VxWorks and other real-time operating systems. Um, in this particular demo, I'm going to show you us targeting a VxWorks target. Um, let's go ahead and tell that into something. And we'll use admin admin. Um, sure, why not? <laughs> and uh, see, so let's do um, show versions. So this particular device is a tipping point 2600 NX um, intrusion prevention device. And um, it's been booting for a couple of couple minutes um, but basically this device we found is vulnerable on its management port but is not vulnerable on the ports that actually do packet inspection so basically um, if you were to target one of these devices you know, in a sort of a practical sense you would have to actually be inside the network and um, you wouldn't actually be able to hit it from the outside because it actually uses a completely different TCP IP stack for its packet packet inspection code than it does for the management code that it runs the operating system so it's kind of interesting the, the vectors that you have to go through I'll show you a little bit about um, kind of the tools that we um, use to validate this vulnerability. Um, to start with, um, the original kind of group that worked on this set of vulnerabilities called Armis, uh, they released a, an open source detector written in Python. When we started with that, we wrote an external module and converted it into something that would work within Metasploit. This is the out actually the output of the external module part in this device. And you can see here it's vulnerable to CVE 2019-12258. Now, the reason why it only targets one CVE is because um, a lot of the other CVEs that you might target um, are difficult to detect without actually exploiting and then causing a crash because since this is a real-time operating system, all the addresses and offsets are going to be very specific to the, how the operating system was built. Even the, even the specific version number of the firmware can make a big difference. Um, so what we want to do next is um, take a moment and show... Um, uh, kind of the Metasploit module in, in, in practice. Now, one reason why we didn't stick with just using the existing tool written in Python and we made it into a, an internal Metasploit module, one is the license. Uh, it was Afro GPL 3.0, which basically meant that um, people couldn't embed this in their own tools, um, which you know kind of is against sort of the Metasploit BSD license. The other thing is that it only worked on Linux. Um, so we wanted to make one that would work on Linux and OS X. So um, the Metasploit uh, module, I'll show you a little bit of differences between it and kind of a, a normal Metasploit scanner module. Because this uh, module needs to scan multiple ports, basically looking for one port that's open, whether it's TCP, Telnet, SSH, HTTPS, um, it's uh, got a new option called our ports instead, and basically lets you target multiple hosts. And we'll go ahead and give it, give it a run and show you what it looks like when it runs. In this particular case, you can see it actually will iterate over all the possible ports you supply to it, and will tell you um, which ports are actually vulnerable to the exploit. Something kind of interesting here is that the Telnet server on this particular target isn't vulnerable, but the SSH port is. Um, so um, if you are actually using this module under life, you may actually want to check multiple ports, even if, um, even if you get a, a false negative on one particular host, on one port, you may actually find a false pot, or you might find a true positive 
on another host that's vulnerable. Um, so given the kind of the finicky nature of real-time monitoring systems and kind of how like everything could be a completely different, you know, uh, loop or TCP IP stack, um, yeah, that's basically what we built into this particular detector. Um, one other thing to note is that because this module sends malformed packets, your routers between segments inside of your network may not actually transmit them. Um, we found in internal testing that uh, certain devices would actually drop these packets along the way. So this may only be exploitable in a lot of scenarios only when you're locally on the subnet via a switch and no other way um, just because the packets get dropped. So tricky exploit. Um, I would say it's probably unlikely that you'll ever see this in any kind of practical sense from an attacker's point of view. Um, but hey, we got the detector and it should be available um, in the next pro release. Any questions? All right, cool. Thanks. Super cool. Thank you, Brent. Brendan, is now good? Or no? Sure. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, yep. Excellent. So uh, while I was working on landing a, uh, an awesome contributor from uh, the community, uh, I was looking through and I found a second method to kind of do the same thing. Uh, this was a PR that was designed for persistence, and it relied upon uh, munging the screensaver and so starting off the payload as if it were a screensaver. Um, through some challenges we were working out, I discovered that there was actually a second way that you can get this sort of persistence within the registry, and that is Windows allows that on the exit of a process, it will automatically start a debugger if you properly flag it. So uh, I went ahead and coded up really quick a PR that did this. Uh, so you can see I've got a session right now on the Windows 7 64-bit service pack one box. Um, and so now we're gonna use uh, this, the, the module, excuse me. Uh, and this uses a technique called image execution options. So in this particular case, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, give it the image file, so the, the binary we want to debug. In this case, we're going to use uh, Notepad. Uh, let's see, we don't really need to spell anything except for session. And that's session one. Go ahead and run this. So over on this machine, well, another window. window, start uh, notepad, we look through, we see what ports 
are up and going. Hopefully at this point, we've finished installing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This could take a moment or two. Regardless, we're using a bind payload, so we can go ahead and see notepad, exit notepad. We don't see anything listening on 4444. And so use the bind payload. We rerun that stat. Even though we can call into it right now. Well, that's thing. The demo gods are not my friends. Ah. Oh, oh, there it is. So we see that even though I haven't gotten uh, the call in yet set up on that machine because I've got to do gem and cell bundler, we see that we've got the port 4444 4, 4, 4 listening here waiting for the call in, which will take place as soon as I can get uh, no Kajiri installed. <laughs> Actually, I wonder if uh, I'll just do it this way. Just use this window. It would help if I spelled that right. Hey. So here we have uh, a session that's brought there. So what wound up happening is we attached a debugger to the exit part of Notepad. So whenever anybody exits Notepad, then we'll open up that listener and be able to call in. Super cool. Excellent.